Welcome to Joy for the Journey, a worship service television ministry presented by your friends at the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We have a great way to start uh, the worship service this morning uh, with a baby dedication. Uh, Reed Nelson Waters is coming forward and he's bringing along his parents. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy and Mandy, and uh, I've said before, but a uh, baby dedication is kind of a misnomer in some ways because uh, Reed here has, is, isn't actually making a formal commitment of any kind, but his parents are in the fact that they, they are dedicating him to the Lord and, uh, and that the Lord would work in his life and ultimately that he would come to know the Lord Jesus as his Savior. I want to read uh, today from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frame of your houses and on the gates. What God is instructing there is for uh, the people of God to make sure they impress upon their children the truth of who God is and make God a reality in your life every day so that uh, Reed gets the benefit of knowing from day one all the way through his life that Jesus is real, that he matters, and that he's a part of mom and dad's life and therefore a part of his life. And so I ask the two of you this morning, uh, do you commit yourselves to be faithful followers of Jesus and show the way of truth to your son, Reed? And church, I ask you, as a family of faith, uh, will you commit yourselves to pray for this family and to pray for this little one that he might come to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior and that he might experience the love of God in his life? If so, say we do. We do. Then, read. I'm going to pray for you, buddy. Let's pray together. Lord God, I just thank you for uh, Reed, uh, for his mom and dad, and the fact that they love him and they love you. And I pray that you would bless him and draw him close to yourself, and that at a very early age, he might profess Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and that he might live out his faith and do your kingdom work. We pray these things in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus who called the children to come to him. Amen. Amen. You were great, buddy. <laughs> I, I, I want to say one more thing, too. Mandy is up front. Our church constitution says that you need to come up front to profess your faith in Jesus Christ in order to join this church family. She's a member of another church, and she's, she, when they got married, she's moved here. She wants to join this church family. So we're going to do two in one. So... Welcome. God bless you. I love those two for deals. Aren't those great? Mandy, we're so happy that you decided to just come forward and join us. And we're so blessed that you brought Reed to us. So, it's good to go away on vacation. I've had a couple of weeks at the First Baptist Church in Naples, Florida, which was wonderful. But you know, nothing's the same as coming home to your family and seeing you all out there on a Sunday morning. It just makes the Sunday. And let's not forget to continue to pray for Reed when he was up here. It just made me think of just a mere 40 years ago when I was up here with John and Rachel Lynn and you all agreed to help me bring her up, and what a fine job you all did. Congratulations, First Baptist Church. She turned out good. Now, if um, you would all join me in the call to worship, let's stand while we read God's word, please. 
Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Thank you, Lord. We appreciate that. Now, if you please join me, since we just said that particular scripture, that's our assurance for our lives. So let's sing about that blessed assurance that we all have. job of praising. Don't ever stop that praising, by the way. Keep it going. Please be seated.
Good morning. Would you please join us in worship this morning? on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my Father's plan. The Son has rescued me. Oh, what a gospel, oh, what a peace. My highest joy and my deepest need. Now and forever he is my light i stand in the gospel of jesus christ church is one we do not walk alone we have his spirit as we press on to lead us safely home salvation where 
precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my death.
Amen. God, we, we trust in you. God, I pray that our joy would be found in you. Um, in this Lenten season, I pray we remember um, what, what this season is supposed to represent, um, that we don't forget what you've done on the cross for us. And God, I pray that we, um, we truly treasure that and we trust in you and in your sovereign plan and in your goodness, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. The scripture today is Ephesians 5, verses 1 to 14. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must, must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetousness, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. We are in the Lenten season, and because of that, uh, we have deviated from our series in First Peter, and we've been focusing on uh, traditional passages that are read during uh, Lent. Uh, Lent began on Ash Wednesday. It's a 40-day period, excluding uh, Sundays as far as the count go. It leads up to Easter. It's a time of uh, repentance. It's a time of drawing near to the Lord, and, and I've just allowed the uh, the historical church to kind of uh, pick the passages for us. And so we looked at the temptation of Christ uh, in, the, in the desert originally. Then last week we looked at a call to holiness. And this morning we're looking at a call to live in the light, as Melinda read for us in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Um, living in the light means that we are followers of he who is the light of the world, uh, Jesus. Jesus announced that, and it's recorded for us in John chapter 8, uh, in verse 12. It says, and again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows uh, uh, me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, you got to have the kind of the context to really get the power and the significance of Jesus' announcement that he is the light of the world. He says this at the temple in the treasury area uh, at the end of the, the tabernacle of booths, the celebration, a weekly celebration in which they would uh, remember the time that they were wandering around in the wilderness and at the conclusion of that, uh, that celebration, the last night of it, uh, they would light the candelabras that were in uh, the, the treasury area of the temple. Those candelabras were described as higher than all the walls around uh, the temple in Jerusalem. They had a ladder at every one of the candelabras in which it's described that a young, fit, holy priest would take the oil up to put in top of the candelabras. Those big candelabras held 65 liters of oil, okay? 
And so it says when uh, the wicks were lit, they would blaze, and it not only lit up the temple at night, but because the temple was at the highest point in Jerusalem, it lit up the city skylight uh, with, with that uh, light. And uh, they would... Uh, the Levites and the priests would dance uh, through the night celebrating and declaring that he, God is the light. And that whole celebration had to do with they were remembering that when they were in the wilderness that God's holy presence was, you remember, a cloud by day and fire, a pillar of fire by night. And so they were declaring in their celebration that God led them and guided them. And at the, the morning of that last day, Jesus is there and he announces, I'm the light of the world. Anyone who follows after me will, won't walk in darkness. So what Jesus is saying is, I'm the presence of the holy God in your midst. I'm the Lord God himself. Uh, people who uh, say Jesus never said he was God have not read the Gospels very carefully because he announces it over and over and over again. And this is just one of those times. And Paul certainly is alluding to the fact that Jesus is the light of the world when he calls us as imitators of God to live in the light and to follow after the light because that's exactly what Jesus said uh, on that day and announced to all who would be his followers. In Matthew chapter uh, 13, verse 43, it tells us, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears, let him hear. And Jesus is announcing that all of us uh, will uh, radiate with his light. And elsewhere, he, he does tell us that you're the light of the world and uh, not to uh, let your uh, light be hindered. Uh, Do Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, a great preacher and illustrator, uh, described how this light works. He says, when Christ was in the world, he was like the shining sun. And when the sun sets, the moon comes up. The moon is a picture of believers, the church. The church shines, but not with its own light. It shines with reflected light. Our light does not originate with us. The light of God's goodness, his grace, his holiness, his power radiate through his followers as we follow after him and seek to uh, honor and bless and please him uh, with, with our lives. And so the Apostle Paul in this passage, specifically in the latter part that Melinda read for, for us, he, uh, he gives both positive instructions in living in the light and negative instructions. And we're going to take them in the order in which they come. And the first is the positive instructions in living in the light. He says, live as children of the light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth and find out what pleases the Lord. So the first fruit, and he kind of changes his analogy because there isn't really a fruit produced by light, right? It's produced through plants. The light is necessary for it, but he, he kind of changes analogies here, but he, he's saying uh, uh, this light from Jesus working through us will produce goodness. In this passage, that goodness is referring to the goodness of the generosity of God. Um, do you believe you can't outgive God? You, uh, you, you, in your, in your service and your devotion, uh, God is always resourcing us, is He not? He's providing all, all that we need. Um, Corey Tinboon, um, familiar with that name? Corey uh, uh, and her family, she, she wrote uh, a book called The Hiding Place. Uh, she and her family were devout believers in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, when Nazi Germany invaded the Netherlands. She, she and her family, they were helping smuggle Jews out, and they got caught in, uh, in that effort. And uh, her father and sister and herself all ended up in 
a concentration camp, and only Corey survived uh, through the war. She tells of the time when she was younger. Her father was a watchmaker by trade, and they were going through some financial uh, struggles, and she remembers a very wealthy uh, uh, customer came in, and he had picked out the most expensive watch in her dad's shop. And he, uh, he, he had paid for the watch, and uh, his, her dad, in conversation, asked, why did you choose this watch, and why have you come here? And he, he explained, well, I actually have another pocket watch that I bought in another shop, and, uh, and it, it's, it's not working, and I took it back, and the son has taken over the shop, and he couldn't fix it. And Mr. Tinboon said, can I see that watch? And he said, sure. And he gave him that watch, and he opened up the watch, and he tinkered with it a little bit, closed it back up, wound it. It started working. He said, you don't need a new watch. He said, Here, here's your watch. Here's your money. Um, and... Uh, when the customer left, Corey went to her dad and said, what are you doing? Why did you do that? Uh, we, did, we need the money. And he said, Corey, what kind of witness would it be in the community when word got out that I sold a watch to a man who didn't need it? I didn't help. Uh, a young man who's starting in the business, who just made a simple mistake, uh, who needs to grow. He said, what kind of witness would that be? That isn't worth the money that the watch would provide. And he said, and we know a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's going to take care of us. And she, she said that moment she learned uh, something important from her father that uh, uh, we, we, we should never compromise, do the right thing every time, uh, be, be generous and gracious and good in your actions. And the Apostle Paul says that's the first of the three uh, fruit of living in the light. The second one is righteousness. Righteousness uh, really means integrity. If you look it up in the dictionary, you'll uh, see uh, two definitions of righteousness. The first is a quality of being honest and having strong moral principles or moral uprightness. And the second definition I actually like better because it says it's a state of being whole and undivided whole and undivided. That's, that's righteousness. I think we live in a day and an age where compartmentalizing a person's life is a very common thing. I can and do and will be something in this environment, in this situation, and then I can be and do something entirely different in a different setting. Can I tell you that if you're a different person on Sunday morning when you're at church, than Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, you have an integrity issue. We, 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 we need to be whole and undivided. We need to be the same wherever we are. We need to be consistent and have integrity. I like the definition of integrity that says integrity is the person you are when nobody else is around. Pretty good, isn't it? Uh, that's that's, that's what it should be. Um, any of you like to go to garage sales? I heard a yes or two. Okay. You know, it's not very often that garage sales ever make the news. But back in 2013, a garage sale made the news. Reason why? A couple in uh, New York City uh, were selling some things. They were downsizing. And they so sold a little bowl little bowl with uh, some Chinese art on it. They sold it to a couple. Uh, this couple 
They didn't know what they were selling, and the couple that bought it didn't know what they were selling. They just thought it was a pretty bowl. They put it on the mantle. Uh, some of you may remember this, this account. Um, and uh, uh, one day they, they had some friends come by, and they said, I, I, I think that that's probably a pretty valuable piece that you, you got there. They bought it for $3. Um, they, uh, they, after their friend encouraged them to uh, have it evaluated, they found out it was from the Northern Sung Dynasty of China. It was over a thousand years old, and they decided that they would sell it at an auction. And uh, the, uh, the entry level price for this bowl, uh, they were going to start with $200,000 for a bowl that they paid $3 for. And it sold for $2 million that they got at a garage sale for three. Now you're all going to be looking at the paper this next week, trying to figure out where the garage sales are, right? Why did I tell you that? I told you that for this reason. You know, as much as uh, we can think, oh my goodness, you should know what you have before you sell it uh, uh, for, for pennies on what its value is. Losing integrity is all about selling yourself out. Selling yourself out for far less than what uh, you're worth, in a sense, to God and to your own being. People uh, kind of sell out uh, by doing those immoral things that were listed at the beginning of the passage, uh, shortchanging what God has put into us. Be careful. Um, righteousness means uh, we, we value that relationship with God and we want to live consistently for him in uh, living in the light and the third uh, fruit of living in the light is truth. Truth, uh, which means absence of falsehood or deception. Uh, if you look up uh, truth in the dictionary, uh, you'll, you'll read, it's a body of real things, events, or facts, actuality. And then every other definition after that um, actually has the word true in it somehow, which I was taught when I was in school that you never define a word by the word itself. So every other one, it, it just kind of shows how uh, truth can be uh, difficult to describe, but uh, truth is, uh, is real. It uh, has a substance. Uh, George Washington Carver was an absolutely brilliant and honored scientist. Uh, we, uh, we know him for what all he did with the peanut. You remember uh, from your, your church history? Uh, and he was a devout believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I love his account uh, when he was given several honors because he always uh, gave a glory to God because he's, he said one time, he said, um, I asked the Lord to reveal to me how the universe was all put together, reveal the truth of the universe. And he said, God told me, you can't handle that. And he said, to which I responded, give me what I can handle. And God said, I'll teach you about the peanut. You can handle the peanut. And he came up with over 300 different uses for the peanut. And he said, in his description of all those discoveries, he said, it's as if God pulled back the curtain of truth on how this little plant could be used for the well-being of humanity. And he liked to quote Proverbs 25, verse 2, that says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings it is to search out a matter. And so um, he's saying the truth is revealed through God. Whether we're talking about goodness or righteousness or truth, they're all character traits of the living God, are they not? 
And so they're a reflection of God. And so the scriptures are telling us we're to reflect that through our lives. And it's not us ultimately, but it's him shining through us, just like Dr. Gray Barnhouse declared. And then Paul gives us some negative instructions on living in the light through verses 11 through 14. The first one, he says, is have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. The fruitless deeds of darkness. In other words, those things that don't produce anything of value or worth, those things that don't lead to knowing God better or honoring him with your life. And early on in verses 3 and 4, he gives some, a list, a short list of some of those things, which are sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, uh, filthy language, foul talk, crude joking. He says they're all out of place uh, for one who's following after the God of light. And the second thing he tells us in the negative aspect is he says, expose darkness. Expose darkness. I think, I think I might have been 10 or 12 when on a family vacation, when we were going through Kentucky, we stopped at Mammoth Caves. And uh, somewhere in the middle of that tour, the tour guide stopped us, and we were in a great big room at, at just a cavernous place, and he said, I'm going to turn the lights off so that you can experience complete darkness. And he turned, he turned a switch behind a rock, and it became pitch dark. I mean, pitch dark. You could not see a thing. And then he said a very, very foolish thing, as far as I was concerned. He said, put your hand in front of your face and see what you can see, which... I could feel that I had put my hand in front of my face, but I could not see a thing. I was very happy when the man pulled out his flashlight because he joked before that, oh, I've tried, the lights won't come on, you know. I'm sure he did that to everybody. And then he turned the light, his little flashlight on, and just the little flashlight was such a relief because in this world, I believe God has designed it in such a way that it reflects a spiritual truth as well. Light always dispels darkness. Amen? Light always dispels darkness, no matter how small the light is. That's why there's some marvelous truths we learn as little children. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. It doesn't have to be a big light, does it? But... When we, when we have the light of Jesus living in us, it, it exposes darkness. It expels darkness. Now, when you read a scripture like this, I think it's really important to always kind of read it in the context of all of scripture. And though uh, we could expose the darkness in other people, that's primarily not the instruction of the word of God. Let me, let me explain. It is easy, I, I, I think it's easy for all of us to recognize error in other people's lives. Do you agree? It is harder to recognize it in our own lives at times. And that's why Jesus said, and it's a different analogy, but it's the same principle. That's why Jesus said, uh, don't be trying to pick out the speck in somebody else's eye when you have a log in your own eye. In other words, do self-examination before you ever try to examine other people. And I would say the same is true when you're applying light and you're talking about exposing darkness. Make sure that uh, you are, are allowing the Word of God and the Spirit of God to expose any darkness in yourself before you start saying, here, let me help you with your darkness. You follow me? Um, we, we, need, we need God's Spirit to, uh, to work in us to radiate uh, His light and dispel any and all darkness in our hearts or in our actions. And lastly, the last thing that Paul says as far as instructions in living in the light is he says, wake up. Now, I've got to tell you, 
I just find it really funny. I chose that we would do this series, and I allowed the Scripture passages basically to be selected for me. And I really didn't put it together until this week that I would be telling you all to wake up on the day that you had to get up an hour earlier. But uh, uh, the, the Scripture here is telling us uh, that, that we're to wake up, we're to be alert. In fact, um, he says, uh, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. As a teenager, one, uh, one evening when my dad got home from work, he was upset, and he wanted to talk to me right away. And he, he, said, uh, he said, you did not take the trash out to the street today, and I told you to do that. And, uh, and you said, okay. And I said, when, when did you say that? I, I, I had no recall whatsoever. And my mom was listening. And do you know moms can tell you things about yourself that you did not know about yourself? You, have you had moms like that? My mom was like that. She, she listened for a little bit. And then she, she interjected and she asked my dad a question. She said, when did you tell him? And my dad said, I told him in the hallway right outside his bedroom. She said, was he going to his bedroom or was he leaving his bedroom to go to the bathroom? He said, well, he's in his pajamas. He was on his way to the bathroom. She said, don't talk to him before he has a shower because he is not awake. It was true. Uh, how many of you are coffee drinkers? Okay. That's how you wake up. I wake up with a shower. I don't drink coffee. But, and I learned that from my mom that day because I didn't know that was true, but I had no recall whatsoever that my dad had said anything and that I had said, okay, and now I'm not giving you all excuses if your parents tell you something. Don't get, oh, I was asleep, okay? Um, but I, I, I was not really fully awake, though I was walking and obviously responded with an okay. Um, what does it mean when the scriptures tell us to wake up? It means we need to be alert, fully aware, right? And the only way that I know how we can do that is to allow God to speak to us through his word and speak to us through prayer. We need his input all the time or we will be walking asleep in this world. And we, uh, we need that input because sometimes I think if we're walking around half asleep, uh, God may have to wake us up in a more radical way. My brother, uh, do you all remember the Garfield comic strip? You know that little cat? Garfield, he hated mornings. My brother was Garfield. He hated mornings. Uh, he only hated one thing more than mornings, school. He hated school and mornings, which made it really bad. And we didn't have alarm clocks, so uh, this is how we were awakened uh, Monday through Friday. Mom would knock on each of our doors, say, good morning. It's time to get up. She always had that cheery voice. Good morning. It's time to get up. And I would get up. My brother, not so much. And after a while, she just got tired of it. And so, because uh, she got tired of going back and saying, it's time to get up. And so one morning she said, if I come back again, I will come with a glass of water. And you will get up. And she did come back with a Tupperware glass, because that's what you had back then when I was growing up, a Tupperware tumbler full of water. And you know what? From then on, when my mom said, good morning, it's time to get up, somehow, miraculously, my brother got up on the first call because she knew he was serious. 
Are God serious about us living in the light and being alert and awake uh, as well? It's better just to listen to him. You don't want the water. Amen? Um, in conclusion, living in the light is all about being imitators of God as beloved children. That's what verse 1 says. Um, the, highest, uh, the highest compliment uh, to anyone is to imitate them, and we're called to imitate God. We're called to uh, show that we love him and we want to follow after him. And it all leads ultimately to uh, seeing him one day. I'll close with this verse from 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I love that verse. It's referring to creation, and God said, Let there be light. And it ends with Jesus in that he is the light of the glory of God. And it points out a marvelous truth that as we walk in the light and pursue him, one day, one day, we get to see him face to face as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Bow with me in prayer, would you? God of light, of truth, of goodness, of righteousness, we worship you and adore you. We thank you for who you are and for all that you have done. And we thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. We thank you that your light penetrates through the darkness of our hearts and our souls and uh, draws us uh, to yourself. I pray, Lord, for any here this morning who may not have yet taken that step of faith to entrust their life to you. And I pray that today they might humbly pray and ask you to come into their life uh, so that they might be your children of light and truth and that they might uh, live for you. Lord, I pray for any um, brother or sister who have tripped and fallen in the darkness that they would repent and turn back to you that they would confess and, uh, and feel your cleansing. And I pray for each of us that we would be awake and alert to live out your will and to, uh, to know you better each and every day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation uh, and response is Send the Light. It's a, it's a missionary song. It's a declaration that uh, the light of the gospel needs to go forth. And as we stand and sing it, I invite you, if you have a decision to make for the Lord, to come forward, and I'd be honored to pray with you. But I want to challenge you all to sing it, and sing it with the understanding, I'm an agent of the light, and it's my responsibility to share that light. And ask the Lord who you might be able to share the light of Jesus with during this Lenten season. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you for watching Joy for the Journey, a presentation of worship from the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. To learn more about the ministries of our church, learn how you can join us in worship, or to support this television ministry, contact us at 1804 South 9th Street, Mattoon, Illinois, 61938. You can also visit us at our website, www.fbcmattoon.org. First Baptist Church, a family for everyone.